Charlotte, North Carolina is conservative, law-abiding, a city of churches. So the community was shocked to learn that motorcycle gangs like the Hells Angels have gained a foothold here. This is Captain Calvin Layton, L-A-Y-T-O-N, isn't that correct? Yes, Spell? sir. Okay. Uh, how would you characterize the relationship between the police department here and the uh, motorcycle group? We have a good relationship with the outlaw motorcycle unit of the Davidson County chapter. Uh, we have Usually, uh, we have no uh, trouble with them whatsoever. How long have they been here? Long time? Has this been a long relationship? This has been a long relationship, approximately eight or ten years. Why do you suppose uh, you haven't had any problem with them here? The main reason we haven't had any problem is uh, they are a local group. They are originally formed here in Davidson County and the city of Lexington. What do they do here? They operate a custom scooter shop, a bike shop on South Main Street, and they also have a clubhouse in the city of Lexington. Ever hear any kind of noise from them, vandalism or anything at all? Occasionally at their clubhouse they have uh, uh, loud music playing sometime on a weekend is about the only problem that we've ever had with them. And one of our units uh, have been assigned to that or get a call. We ask them to turn it down and they do. They cooperate immediately. Well, why do you keep them under surveillance? Anytime that because of the uh, other motorcycle gangs or anything, we have uh, always kept them under surveillance because any cycle that would come through here flying a different color from the outlaws, we would be uh, maybe anticipating problems. Have you had any problems so far? We have not. Uh, are you worried at all because of what has happened elsewhere about the possibility of rivalry gangs or any kind of shootout or anything like that? We are not. Don't think no that'll problem. happen here. Don't think that'll happen here. We hope not. Uh, we have. Uh, we cooperate with other agencies, but we have we don't anticipate any problems. They're pretty good citizens then here. They are for us. How would you describe them as good citizens, or would you describe them as good citizens? Yes, I would. We have no problem with them. We have uh, problems with other type people, sometimes more than we do with them, but we have very little trouble with the outlaws in the Lexington chapter. Do they ever exhibit uh, positive uh, citizenship behavior? Yes, they do. Uh, sometime back in their neighborhood, uh, they did maintain and help keep up some of the residents' uh, shrubbery and maybe the guard, uh, yards, something to that effect. How about uh, cooperating with the police department? We've always had a good relationship. They cooperate with us. If Another agency calls and reference or, or ask for assistance. Uh, we do get in touch with the president of the club and he immediately or immediately gets in touch with us or has cooperated all the time. All right, do you have anything else? Mr. Uh, we're gonna interview him as well, but uh, rolling. Give me the spelling of your name and your okay. title and uh, what you do. My name is Greg Kirkman, G-R-E-G-K-I-R-K-M-A-N. I'm a detective with the Davidson County Sheriff's Department. If you can speak up just as loud as you can, okay. I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> We're probably going to cut for a second. I Rolling? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, how would you characterize the relationship between your department and uh, the motorcycle gang? We have a very good relationship with them. 
in this county. Uh, we uh, are able to uh, converse with them uh, on a regular basis if, if either party so desires. Uh, in the past, they've been uh, helpful to us on uh, matters that we have investigated and also other agencies. To what extent will they cooperate with you? Uh, they have uh, in the past went as far as uh, helping us uh, recover property taken from burglaries and uh, on one occasion uh, one of their members has testified for the state uh, in the past case. That's unusual, isn't it? Yes, it is. Why do you suppose they are so willing to cooperate? Well. Uh, I guess it probably all goes back to the chapter here. Uh, the chapter here is consists uh, mainly of people that were born and raised uh, in this area, and uh, by and large, they're uh, generally good citizens uh, of the city and county here. I guess they don't live up to their name, the outlaws. Well, not around here. That isn't true of those elsewhere, though. I suppose. Uh, from what I understand, uh, they're having problems with them elsewhere. Well, uh, what uh, what do they do here? Uh, uh, in other words, they have nationwide a bad image. Do they uh, uh, do they fulfill that image here, or is it a completely different thing? What what do they do if they aren't uh, menacing and uh, if they don't if they're not outside the law? The members uh, of this chapter all uh, are good citizens. I think primarily uh, they ride their bikes on the weekend. That's about it. They're all gainfully employed through the week and uh, just members of regular members of the community during the week. Well, how would you describe their clubhouse? Well, they have a, a clubhouse down here that, uh, well, they have a fence around it and uh, somewhat crude fortifications. Uh, other than that, uh, that would be about the only thing uh, that would really distinguish them from being normal citizens. Why do you think they have to maintain such a uh, clubhouse with fortifications and so on? I think primarily it's for uh, their own protection. They, uh, I'm sure in the back of their mind they've uh, well, they read about the uh, occurrences in other cities, and uh, I guess that's always in the back of their mind. What are they afraid of? Uh, rivalry, possibly, between other gangs and, them, and themselves. What do they think might happen? Well, uh, I suppose they're subject to uh, be retaliated upon for things that they or other members of the, the outlaw organization may have done. Or at least what they represent. That's true. Uh, this has been a long association, I suppose. Um, is it surprising to you that they aren't menacing, that they don't live up to their image here? No, not really. Uh, by and large, I think uh, most people tend to stay fairly quiet where they live. If, if they're going to do anything, I think they're going to go elsewhere to do it. Yep. Okay. Uh, do they cooperate with you on uh, cases? They have in the past, yes, sir. In what way? They uh, have, uh, in some instances, helped us uh, recover uh, stolen property. and. Uh, what comes to my mind the most is one instance they, uh, one of their members testified for the state uh, in a matter. That's unusual, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Why? They, uh, I think probably, uh, well, as I say, they're uh, all local people. I don't think that... Uh, they want to see anything bad happen in their hometown, just the same as anybody else. I guess my question is, why is it unusual for one member of a motorcycle gang to testify against some other motorcycle gang or other member? 
I mean, do they live by a certain secret code, or do they just don't do that, or what is what is it about them that that makes it unusual when they testify? Are they afraid well, of retaliation, or what? Generally, they uh, try to stay out of the limelight, and uh, they uh, really don't uh, want the publicity. That type of thing. Are they concerned? I mean, why don't they want the publicity? Well, the uh, there again, I think you're getting back to the image of motorcycle gangs as a whole, and uh, they're pretty quiet around here, and they uh, they just don't want to call any attention to themselves. Did you cut us on the walk, Yeah. Okay, I think. Rolling. Rolling. Okay. Uh, how would you characterize these motorcycle gangs? Well, they're basically trash. They're a, a group of people, very small in number, but they're into prostitution, they're into drugs, they're into all kinds of uh, acts of vandalism. They're, they're cowards in, in most counts because they go around armed to the hilt. They attempt to terrorize people. And the trouble about them is this. They do just that. They've taken over some uh, businesses, mainly pornography shops, uh, massage parlors, and yet their numbers are so small, but their influence uh, has tentacles spreading all out into communities. Uh, they ruin it for the good bikers who number hundreds of thousands in this country. And uh, they're a menace. They're, they're very dangerous. Uh, we don't like them. I don't know why they've decided they love this place so much, but they've congregated here in North Carolina. Are they Difficult to deal with in terms of trying to get a case against them or prosecute them? Extremely difficult. Uh, you know, we can handle uh, organized crime. We can handle drug dealing uh, to a great extent. But the trouble in trying to uh, break cases on these hoodlums is that they don't ever allow witnesses in most cases to testify. We've made case after case against these hoodlum mafia bikers, yet uh, the witnesses uh, say they're going to cooperate in the beginning and then when the end comes, they're not there, or they disappeared. There are several persons uh, who have simply disappeared from the face of the earth who were going to testify against uh, this small number of, of hoodlums. Uh, it's very hard to make cases, and we're trying though, very hard right now. It, it takes a cooperative effort among local, state, and federal officials to do so. Uh, I'm going to try to run them out of this state. How are you going to do it? We're going to have a, a series of crackdowns that will make them realize that it's not healthy to be in this state, and I don't want to run them to the other states, but we want to make it so tough on them and let them know that we're not going to have less than 1% of the bikers in this country, much less, are into this kind of very hard criminal activity. We want to make it so tough on them that they say, North Carolina or this area is not the place for us to be. We're going to get out of here, and then I want the federal government to help me follow them wherever they go. Uh, they, they shouldn't be romanticized. They're nothing but absolute, low-class, criminal hoodlums. And we've had far too much uh, romanticizing of movies in the past, The Wild One, uh, the books that glamorize them. There's nothing glamorous about them. They're, they're very low-class individuals who, who live by criminal organized crime. That's the new organized crime of this country, and I don't like it one bit that they're coming into this state. Why don't you infiltrate their ranks? Well. That's rather difficult to do. I'm not saying that we don't in some way, but uh, if we were to infiltrate their ranks, we would be asked to commit criminal acts, and we're not going to do that. Sometimes the initiation requirement is that you kill somebody. You at least have to commit a very vile act of some kind to even be considered a member, and we're not going to do that. I just wouldn't have it. That would be having the law break the law, so it's difficult to infiltrate, and most people are scared of it. We're not, but we can't infiltrate them to that degree. Then what kind of action can you take against them to run them out of the state? I think it takes a state, local, and national approach. You've got to get at the businesses they're, they're running, the massage parlors, the porno shops, and that takes the cooperation of the federal government, the Bureau of Alcohol and Tax, the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agencies, and mainly the IRS. I believe that we are working on some cases now that will show them that their money 
is what can break their backs. Uh, many of them are under hundreds of thousands of dollars in the drug trade. Uh, it's sort of a, a halfway point between the North and the South. Here in North Carolina, they control a lot of the speed traffic in these areas. They have these clandestine labs. They're making millions of dollars that is not being taxed whatsoever. I think that's how we break their back. We, we stop their businesses, their money flow, and they can't buy their bikes, and they can't terrorize people. But we've got some things up our sleeves. There are indications that these motorcycle gangs have gotten to the point now where they don't even ride motorcycles anymore. It's become that sophisticated. Well, they had the world run here in North Carolina this year at uh, Henderson, North Carolina, some 40 miles north of Raleigh here. That was the world meet of the Hells Angels. You saw a lot more cars, fancy cars there, than you did motorcycles. In fact, they haul around their motorcycles now in very glamorous vans. You would think you were going to the world jumping meet in the vans you see. Uh, they don't ride motorcycles that much, uh, except for their big show-off days, like the, a race here and there or just a show of power. They, they operate uh, like the mafia. No, it, you can't tell a, a real motorcycle mafia person now exactly by the bike they ride or, or how they even look. It, it's the new mafia. And they're doing all the things that the Mafia's done before. They divide up territories. They, they kill off one another. In fact, the thing that worries us most is that innocent citizens will be hurt by uh, two gangs in warfare. We had a shooting here just two weeks ago on the Virginia-North Carolina border where we strongly suspect that a rival gang came up the road and mowed down uh, another gang. They kill one person, and they could have killed 11 people. It's a miracle they weren't. But look at the innocent people that could have been killed. That's why I'm so concerned. And they. They enslave women, too. That, that's one of the primary purposes of the motorcycle gang, is to get women involved with them, make them slaves, get them into prostitution, drug running. Uh, that's the, the most, uh, uh, it's just low and base of what the motorcycle gangs do, these willing women who become slaves to them. In terms of comparing them as far as the threat they pose to society, uh, are they as dangerous as, let us say, the Mafia is? Well, in numbers they're not, of course, but they're dangerous in this sense. Their small numbers uh, have great consequences. They, they just reach out. And wherever they go, they've got runners. Uh, there are many more associates of motorcycle Mafia gangs than there are actual members. You've got to be a real tough uh, actor to become a member, and your membership uh, dues are very, very small. And you know, if you get to be one of the, the filthy few in the Hells Angels gang, you have to kill someone before in the witness of another one. So it's not their numbers that are dangerous, it's their influence, and they are a new kind of mafia. We, we've seen all of the indicia of mafiosa coming in with these motorcycle gangs. They have sophisticated means of communication. Uh, they know almost as much about what we're doing as we do about them, I would say more. Uh, they have all kinds of codes, and they're really good at not being brought to justice. So we're going to try to change that. In what way are they good at not being brought to justice? They have a code that if anybody rats on a member, they're going to get them before the trial date comes. They've done that just several, several times. Very rarely have we ever had a gang member testify against another. There was a, a shootout in Durham some years ago. And uh, we, we brought indictments. Those indictments did no good because the rival gang that uh, was, who eventually was the victim would not testify against the perpetrators of the crime. So nothing was ever done. Time and time again that happens. It's the reign of terror. And I don't really know when we've done uh, any convictions except when we catch a guy red-handed selling drugs, for instance. Then we need no testimony. But when it's been violence perpetrated by one gang against another, We've really never done it because that code is so strong and it's enforced by killing. Who then are the victims of the motorcycle gangs? Is it society at large or is it an internecine kind of thing? Or Well, I, I must say I'm not as concerned about the, the victims among the gangs themselves as I am about the innocent citizens. Uh, there was one person standing at a, a, a joint frequented by motorcycle gangs uh, a little over six months ago who was totally innocent and was shot dead because there was a rival gang war going on at that time in Charlotte. And so 
they're both victims and society too because we don't know what they're going to be doing at any one time or what kind of warfare they're going to have in the middle of town. Uh, it's only a miracle that there weren't innocent people killed in the shootout uh, some two weeks ago on the Virginia-North Carolina border. just happened that there were no more motorists there at that time. They are a danger too in this that they're taking over uh, massage parlors and whole strips in certain places. Uh, they're dealing heavily into the drug trade, and that, that's a, a growing cancer to everybody in this country. I, I think drug traffic is the number one problem, and they're certainly doing their best to help make it the number one problem in the country, in the criminal area. Now, how would you describe the people who join, or a person who joins a motorcycle gang? I'm talking about these vicious gangs. They're misfits. In most cases, they're, they're not attractive people. And you don't have to be pretty to succeed in this world, but it certainly helps you to be very unattractive to be a full-fledged motorcycle mafia gang member, I think. Uh, they come from families where they've been on the shady side of life. They think this gives them the macho that they need to compete against a world that's so standard now. The rest of the people go to work in ties and coats, and yet they can be the big guy because they've got the big motorcycle. And better than that, they've got the firepower, weapons galore. Uh, some of them have arsenals uh, almost uh, equaling the National Guard at places. So they, they get back at society this way in, in their own cult. I think it's sort of like the, the Reverend Jim Jones cult almost uh, with what they can make members do, especially the women, that they become uh, almost demigods of, of some sort. They, they strike back at society. What role do women play in the motorcycle gangs? How important are they? Very important. They're completely subservient. Uh, we have pictures of women doing the most god-awful things in public for their, their men. Uh, they call them the lowest form of life that we could. They, they're workhorses, is all they are. They go out and do the prostitution. They divide their, their bounty in a very unequal manner with their old man, as they call them. They are nothing but virtual slaves to the motorcycle gangs. And uh, we've interviewed particular women who, who think it's a, a feather in their cap to do that. It's a, it's a cult type thing. Why would a woman subject herself to that kind of torment and abuse? Well, most of the women that get into it get into it very young. They run away from home. They're 14, 15 years old some of them from very good families. And all of a sudden, they're on the back of a big bike, they're riding down the road, and the wind's whipping by, and they're thinking of the movies, and they were some big, tough, macho man. And before long, they're caught up in it. They're treated very nice in the beginning. And then, all of a sudden, they're working massage parlor, really prostitution. That's what almost all of them are. They get them on drugs, and then they wean them from the drugs and make them totally enslaved to get more drugs. And before long, they're trapped. They can't go tell then. Uh, we have instances of where women left and they bring them back. It's like the big city Johns uh, or the, the guys that have the prostitutes out in the big cities. What, uh, what happens to a woman if she tries to escape or run away? Well, on many cases, they have found the woman and they brought her back and uh, beat her up very badly. Uh, there have been other instances where they have, we have found women dead. That's not only in this state, that's all over the country. And I do not know of any case uh, where a woman has testified against any of the, the persons who virtually maimed her ki or killed her because they terrorize them so very much. Uh, you have different kinds of women. You have some women who are the old lady to one old man, and no biker bothers them. Then you have other women who are just uh, tag-alongs, uh, the so-called camp whores, they call them. And they're used by everybody there. But once they get in it, they rarely ever get out until they escape uh, sometime in their older years when the motorcycle gangs kick them out because they're no longer useful to them, but they never testify after that. You've described uh, huge arsenals that these people have. Why can't under the law, can't you uh, go in and confiscate weapons and so on? How is it that you can't bust up such an arsenal? 
Well, you, you have to deal with informants in this kind of business, and people don't understand that informants are, are most often a very low form of life. And you don't really know whether these informants are telling the truth or not. You must have, of course, a search warrant, and you must completely describe what is to be searched and what's in there. So we don't go around breaking doors in places unless we know that there is some illegality going on at that moment. And we know that some of their weapons would be uh, legal. What bothers me is that you have a public meeting out here, and we have pictures galore of motorcycle gang members, say at a funeral of one of their members, toting all sorts of weapons, but yet there's not actually a law that says you can't carry a weapon in public if it is not hidden. You know, it's, it's got to be uh, to, against the law, it's got to be hidden. Well, here they're walking around with carbines on their shoulders, a show of force. Uh, I think we need a law that says that you can't go around in public gatherings wearing weapons to terrorize people. That's the purpose of wearing the weapons. You know, you have to abide by a constitution. And I keep telling our officers, you know, you can't go breaking in on people unless you have them committing criminal acts. You, you tolerate a lot in a, a constitutional society, but I just think there are other ways that we can nab them on not paying their income taxes, on extortion, drugs, and we'll try. Is that one of the problems, uh, a lack of uh, certain kinds of laws which would, um, which would aid you in dealing specifically with well, such I, gangs? I, I think so. Uh, this state, for instance, doesn't have a statewide grand jury. I think we need something of that sort that has a lot of protections in it, quite obviously. We need a tighter vehicle registration law. They steal motorcycle parts just by the hundreds every year. We broke up a ring in one area of the state where they had stolen 28 motorcycles. Uh, we need to also use the habitual offender statute. Some of these people have a record a mile long of petty offenses, uh, all kinds of traffic offenses, and people think, well, why can't you stop them by, you know, giving them a ticket for the tires that are too worn and this and that? Well, that's penny ante stuff. What we need to do is to have a massive crackdown on the part of federal, state, and local officials using every single law we've got on the books to tear them out of their frames, and we can do it if we'll all stick together and do it. Have you so far had the cooperation of the federal government in doing this, or I do they care? A, I formed a task force uh, some 18 months ago, and it seems to be working. Now, the federal officials have some problems. They can't give us information at times because of the federal privacy laws, which really irks me, to tell you the truth. We can give any information we've got to fellow law enforcement officials all over the country, yet the federal officials cannot give us certain information, which is ridiculous. That's why I think some of the, the task force on violent crimes recommendations will be helpful if they are brought to bear. And I've testified before that task force, like uh, the, the search and seizure laws that we have right now. If you break into someone's, uh, lawfully, break into someone's home to get evidence on illegal activity. If you happen to pick up something you weren't supposed to pick up, they throw out the whole case. That's ridiculous. We've got to get rid of those laws. The federal government could do more in this regard nationwide than anybody else, because if we run them out of North Carolina, they're going somewhere else, and it's up to the federal people to follow them, and we have a, probably the most cooperative task force in this state of anywhere in the nation. I, I think it should be a model. I have determined that we can do that. The Attorney General of the United States agrees with me and has directed that all the federal officials in North Carolina cooperate with this office, and they have done that. How sophisticated are these gangs in terms of uh, national links and in terms of communication and uh, organization? It's rather amazing. Uh, the Hells Angels, for instance, uh, can within a few minutes notify chapters all over the country about exactly what's going on where, what to do, how to handle it. They can have bail money made up in a, a few minutes for someone who's been arrested. It's rather amazing. They have codes. Uh, they one time even infiltrated a telephone company. So they are very good at communications. Uh, they may not look like much, but they certainly are. They've got their act together as far as eluding the law. In terms of the
the preceding was Michael Franklin. Preceding was Michael Franklin. Michael Franklin Fananzo. Fananzo. F-A-Fananzo. F-A-N-A-Z-Z-O. F-A-N-A-Z-Z-O. Uh, next photo will be Larry Wayne Mac McDonald? McDaniels. McDaniels, the Outlaws. M-C-D-A-N-I-L. Boy. They pulled guns out on them. On who? On the buses. They used to let people right there. Yeah. They used to get mad at them. Ran them off? Mm -hmm. They didn't have my brownie drink. <laughs> you mean they pulled guns? Mm-hmm. From the window up there. One man brought a handgun out to his car, a machine gun that he... Uh, well, I know they ride up and down the street here on a motorcycle. I said, 
seen about five. I of think them I know together. the man. My, I know the main man. I think. Hey. Let's see.
But, uh, you know, like I said, I guess they carry a low profile because they know what could occur if it did uh, cause a lot of commotion and trouble. But the neighbors, they don't call in that much for us complaining about them. They don't. No. Every now and then, I guess, when you, you know, special occasion they have their parties and stuff down there, we get a, you know, loud music or something like that, or maybe they might just fire firearm every now and then, but other than that, we don't, they haven't really caused that much trouble. Thank you.